The world's greatest tenor, Placido Domingo, is 60 years old this year. Are we ready? But just when most singers would consider their voice to be fading and retirement beckoning, Domingo is pushing himself harder than ever. When I was very, very young, everybody knew about somebody called Placido Domingo, who, who was the, 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 the leading tenor of his generation, of course. He was just the most warm and incredible person, you know, he was sort of like a big huggy thing, you know, he loved to sort of hug people. I've often said I think there should be a scientific study done of Placido Domingo as a man, as a human being, because he's a multi-talented, a multifaceted individual. <laughs> Placido Domingo is acclaimed as the world's most complete opera singer, his incredible voice matched by his dramatic talents and heroic stance on stage. He has been at the top for more than 30 years and has shown his versatility in more than a hundred of opera's leading roles, from the lyrical romance of Verdi to the epic drama of Wagner. I am about to arrive to my 3,000 performance. So I'm very proud of being able to uh, be on the stage still at 60 and, uh, you know, being able to still pro probably be around another, for a few years more singing. Placido is a, a complete tenor. He's a great musician, a great actor. He's very flexible in any sense, vocally and uh, staging. And so what can be that if not very special? probably the most convincing performer I ever seen in my life on stage. Not only his uh, extraordinary voice, but the way he acts and the way his uh, musicianship and his, his tremendous uh, 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 expression. this kind of links that he established between stage and, and audience. He's great. The most important element in his success was very much loved for, by the audience, by the women. So in him, a kind of ideally handsome hero. But he was a handsome man. 
And, you know, the women uh, during the performance and after the performance, you know, you couldn't get anywhere near him for women. I mean, I don't blame them. They, and, and it's wonderful. He's a hero. It's a heroic voice. It's a beautiful sound. And, you know, you fall in love with it immediately. passes They're on stage he has to watch out how he's dressed but in certain certain roles he's still very damn damn attractive damn sexy I think that what makes Domingo special in the history of opera is not only the voice, which again you can like or not as everything else, is the particular moment of changing, of moving classic art from the stage, from the theater, to the movies, to the open, uh, open air spectacles. I don't like to use cliches, but he has some special magic. Um, I, I would say that uh, when I'm working with the, with, with the three tenors, Pavarotti has an incredible power. Carreras is velvet. It's so smooth. And Placido has the best of both worlds. Between us has been always, and it, it will be always, a kind of singing competition. And I think that this is very positive uh, for the, the, the result of, uh, of each concert. We are different. And in the meantime, we have uh, more or less uh, the voice of the tenor. The three of us, we have tremendous love not only for opera, but also for tenor voice. So for us to be on stage together, it means also to enjoy, uh, to, to, to listen to, to the other two. There is a real friendship relation between us and a tremendous harmony. And I think that this creates a kind of chemistry that is, in my opinion, the, the key of, of our being together on stage. The three tenors have been enjoyed by millions of people, but Domingo, Carreras and Pavarotti have been criticized by the opera establishment for going perhaps a little too far down market. I think Basto, like the many other singers, and certainly the three tenors, have perhaps gone too far in trying to popularize themselves 
and the things they sing. Now, I'm greatly in favour of reaching out to the public, but I think there's a limit to what you actually do in that direction. He gathers people by the hundreds. They just flock to him. And so that is of great use to, to opera houses and for sponsorship and things like that. And to pull in the people who wouldn't normally come in. There are people, women, men, or, or, you know, who would never normally go to opera. But he can, he can absolutely charm them. And they're taken in. And it's wonderful because you, we get a lovely new audience constantly. I have had many letters which I can show how people say it. Before I hear you now, this popular concert or in the three tenors concert, I would never dream to go to the opera. And now I go and I am full-time subscriber. Domingo has done more to popularize opera than any artist of his generation. Yet, with his singing career inevitably drawing to a close, many of his fans fear that soon he will be lost to the world of opera. But Domingo has long dreamt of running an opera company. His chance came in 1995, when the Washington Opera asked him to become their artistic director. I think he thought that by 1990 or so he would have stopped singing and I think he himself is amazed that he's still singing ten years later than he thought he was going to be and I think he was concerned that since the, usually the life of a singer is a relatively short one what was he going to do with all this energy when he'd stopped singing But he had this passion for working uh, in an opera company. So that was clearly something that had always been on the cards for him. Okay, okay. I'll let you know. In the past, it has been quite common for an eminent singer to become an artistic director of a house. You don't actually settle down, I think, and ask the question, well, you know, what other sort of qualifications has he got beyond the obvious ones? But I think the obvious ones are so strong uh, that when the opportunity comes, both for him and for uh, somebody looking for an artistic director, you both jump to each other and say, come along. Washington, D.C., it may not be a great uh, opera centre, although the opera company there has grown considerably in recent years, and I've seen some very good performances there. It is one of the better of the not very top American opera companies. It also happens to be the national capital. It does no harm if the president or senators or ambassadors are seen going there. It's a place to be seen, to be going to. And uh, from that point of view, I suppose he sensed that it was not a bad place in which to, as it were, cut his teeth as artistic director. Yes, you mean anything better? Because we talk, then we can talk. Ah, Michelle. Yes. I, I was thinking of the following. Tomorrow we have full day at the opera, yeah, and it is uh, both heavy orchestra rehearsals. Can we make something? Domingo has followed in the musical footsteps of his parents. Both were stars of the Zarzuela, Spain's own traditional form of comic and romantic light opera. In the late 1940s, the Domingo family emigrated from Spain to Mexico City, where they established their own opera company devoted entirely to the performance of Zarzuelas. And I always uh, not only like the music, but I like the fact of, of organizing, casting, and so on. So I think it was kind of a, um, a whole life, a whole life idea about if one day, maybe after I end my career singing, I will be 
um, an artistic director of, of an opera house. Can we establish something? I mean, I don't know how much catering we can get. It will be uh, better maybe to do it between the rehearsals. They will not allow us to serve food in any rooms in, any in the Kennedy Center. Rooms. Everybody is. I mean, it's a large. So it must be 175. I knew he wanted to do something like this. And um, several other people, friends of his, also had the instinct that this was the time. So my job was to sound him out and get it moving. Well, that's not, you know how, you all have seen how he moves. <laughs> Tracking him down was what took time. You know, I sing in Bayreuth, I sing in, in, in Salzburg, I sing at the Met, I sing in Washington, I sing in Los Angeles, I sing in Vienna, I sing in Covent Garden, I sing in La Scala. I'm singing in every opera house. It took six months to just focus on it and, and, and get him to, but he was, once I, I told him what they wanted to propose, he did give it a lot of serious thought. When this approach was made, because, of course, in my conversations and in my interviews and so on, I was talking about the idea of one day. So when all this came ab across, I, I was already th thinking that maybe I was not going to be singing anymore, so that that was the right age for me to do it. Hey, Susie, how are you? Okay. There were a lot of people who thought he was going to come to Washington and be very, very hands-off, and that has not been the case. He's been very much an active director. His programming is not orthodox. <clears throat> I mean, he has all the wonderful ones like the Il Trovatore's and the Bohem's and the Tosca's, but he's, he's had a little courage to bring something like Il Guarani, which was a Brazilian national opera, but nobody here has ever heard it. <laughs> I think that um, Domingo has been a pretty fair success here. Um, uh, but maybe only a middling success uh, as an artistic director. Perhaps there are some of the modern operas he did which were not so terribly strong. People said, well, why is he doing that? You know, but he, wa he wants to broaden our horizons. What you want is then, of course, if you are going to be there, that that company can improve on the time you are going to be there. That otherwise is not any reason for you to accept a position just to keep it even, you know. I mean, to, and uh, I think it's not only to keep it, uh, to, to bring it up and to bring it uh, really to an international, great international level. He knows the business in every aspect. And this is very important. Uh, you can rely in, uh, on his opinion, and you know that when Placido gives you an opinion, is an honest one, and you know that uh, it's for the best of the whole product, if I can use this word. I prefer myself, if, if you don't mind. I, I, prefer, I prefer if it, if it goes this way. I like that. I like that. This side. This side. Okay, will so you give me one minute to move okay. this light over here? Mm -hmm. Yes, I like this too. This is better. He once said to me, when somebody was complaining about being unable to reach him, he said, do tell him I'm not one of those tenors who sits by the phone waiting for it to ring. He has this extraordinary sense of adventure. We all at school have known, and university have known peop uh, people who are overachievers, who are compulsive workers and cannot stop. Uh, I mean, with Placido, you have that writ large. And of course, one of the, the most difficult components of that is traveling. He can't stop traveling. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.
This is 105.1 FM KMZT Classical Cable Chart. Rich Camparella with you on this Tuesday morning. On the freeways, we've got no signal alerts working at the moment, just the usual pockets of slowing. And Southern California weather, more of the same. Highs ranging from the 70s along the shore to the low and mid 90s in the warmest inland valleys. And here's a reminder, we'll be broadcasting live from UCLA. Domingo's most recent challenge has been his appointment as artistic director of Los Angeles Opera. September saw his first opening night. Ladies and gentlemen, it appears that the audience seems to be late for their And already there were huge expectations surrounding his new role. Absolutely. <laughs> Placido's image and also his, his ability to raise money. I mean, the amount of money that has come since Placido was appointed, I envy. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Looks divine. You know, you have done a, yeah. a phenomenal job. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Are we all in the picture? In Los Angeles, it's not just enough to have the quality you need to have celebrity appeal and Domingo blessedly is one of those people who everyone knows even if it's in the context of the three tenors which to the layperson is oh yeah it's Pavarotti Domingo and the other guy but that puts him in the realm of the rarefied celebrity that can raise big bucks <laughs> Two to KMZT FM Classical 105.1 K Mozart. Tonight is the big one for opera in LA. It is the opening night for Los Angeles Opera at 7 tonight, Verdi's Aida. The conductor for tonight's performance is the company's new artistic director, Placido Domingo. Have a great performance. Oh, you too. Very much. Are we ready? Okay. Okay. So here we go. The conducting, of course, has been growing in me because of the experience of the singer. And year after year after year, I was hoping one day I will do it. So about 20 years or something ago, I start, and I start doing very little. It was like a, a new thing because I will conduct one performance now and the next one will be a year later. Then it will pass maybe 18 months and then I have two performances because I didn't have time. Then I decide that uh, then I will have to find time. I said I, I have to start doing more. For four or five years, I have been going on into a 20 performances, 30. This year, for instance, I have 40 performances to conduct. And basically, it's uh, almost totally Verdi. Uh, can we take it there from letter L, the entrance of the banda, please? Hmm? Mark the entrance of the banda, okay? Okay. Beautiful. This was the first time I worked with him as a conductor. And I must say, uh, I think it's beautiful in a way because he understands singers. And he's obviously very sympathetic and understanding to singers.
just one thing after don't worry it's just one 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 stop when we're going to again after splendid everybody so we continue although his his technique is getting fine every year he and i think Absolutely. He's not nothing naughty. I'm going, what I'm going to say, I think he he also also knows about this. I mean, his his gesture is not as perfect as the gesture of somebody who has been conducting for years and whose whose main profession is to be a conductor. But on the contrary, because he conducts at least when he works with me, he conducts the music that he sings. You can feel that you the the, the communion with the with the with the conductor is great. <laughs> I think it could be nice, Craig, if, even if he's in one, but to make the difference. Cercar che giova. I said, che giova. You know, it's not cercar che giova. Cercar che giova. Alleluia non si It is uh, to look, I mean, it won't help. So you have a little bit to separate the expression. I am first of all thinking on the needs of a singer. And I can anticipate mistakes because I can see when somebody takes even breathing, I know when it's going to be coming the, the note, you know, I can, I can see and I, and I need immediately, I already tell them, I, I, I really say to the singers, then I, not to worry, then I will be with them. Music maestro, please. He decided to conduct Tosca here with the opera company. And Shikov was Carabadosi. So he invited me to all the rehearsals and the previews and, you know, all the... And then finally I went to the pre premiere and they did several performances. Now, Shikov was not available for the last performance. You know who sang Carabadosi? Placido. Where in the history of music the conductor goes and sings? Bravo, everybody. Beautiful. Are we with time? As singer, conductor, and artistic director, Domingo now enjoys unrivaled power and influence in the world of opera. And it's allowed him to pursue his dream of a permanent zarzuela company for America's growing Hispanic population. He takes his Mexican, Latin American background very seriously enjoys being in an environment in which he can try to promote the links between the European opera world and the culture of Latin America. So for these reasons it seems right and sensible for him at that stage in his career when he was graduating into artistic directorship as well as keeping up the singing, the conducting and all the other things in his busy life that the cities to which he should gravitate and whose invitations he accepted were Washington DC and Los Angeles. En una de esas de la Extremadura Tengo una casina blanquina y chiquita Parece un palacio mi pobre casina Pues guarda una bofa como la infantía Me llena de gozo saber que la bofa Me aguarda y me espera contando las horas I grew up with this kind of music the music that my parents, they dedicate all their lives to bring to the public. Being a 
going to make the public know the Sassuela more, uh, doing performances here at the pavilion, but then I want that we have a permanent, uh, uh, this kind of art, which it will be wonderful for the Spanish population, but also for the American, I should say. We did two Sassuelas in Washington, and I did uh, one in Los Angeles, and my idea is to continue doing that and also to be able to establish kind of a company in both places and even the, even not only in those two places but that these companies they can travel through all the United States to all the cities and there are a great amount of uh, Spanish speaking people. Do you like it? Yes. You like it? Yes, good. It's beautiful, no? This is a good opera to see. I think Domingo is really pretty fine at whatever he touches. Artistically, the legacy is a little more mixed. Uh, he came in with an idea about presenting lots of zarzuelas. Well, they flopped, absolutely. Um, Washington has a rather small Hispanic population. I think it would work in Los Angeles, perhaps. But it's been hit or miss. <laughs> He wants us to have a greater awareness of South America and Latin America and of Spanish music. And I think in this country, when you have so many people of Spanish and Latin origin, this is a wonderful thing. Domingo's love of Zarzuela is matched only by his passion for finding and promoting new talent. His most personal project in recent years is Operalia, his own annual singing competition which has discovered many of opera's newest stars. Here we are. Here we are again with some newcomers. The Opera Alea competition brings to the forefront a lot of the finest young singers of the younger generation. And as it's Domingo's competition, he's able to be present, he's able to spot the winners, help spot the winners, chair the competition committee. Because what I think is that sometimes it might hurt one of the best singers, yeah. because sometimes if you take a, he, it has a 10, and the lowest point is 8, you are taking 18 points automatically of, of, yeah. one, of, the, yeah. uh, of one of the big, I don't think we are going to do that. We have more than 1,000 uh, requests, and out of 1,000 uh, or more, we have to select only 40 singers, you know. A big percentage of the singers around the world today, they have been winners of Operalia. The key word, the, the spirit of the competition, was not finding only a fine singer, but an artist. That was what made, and I think it still makes, that contest different from other contests. What are you going to sing for us? I will sing uh, Area of Marguerite from Faust. Yep. Okay. I'm absolutely astonished about the commitment that he has to it, how well informed and rela he he knows everything. I mean, he knows all the people. Uh, he really leads the, the competition and uh, is uh, not, just a, not just a figurehead. 
to uh, to kind of uh, you know help develop uh, what, what I'd like to do with the song it, it is kind of nerve-wracking you know, the tenor is hearing me sing, and uh, you know, if he likes me, it, it could help out quite a bit. Especially at the beginning of, of our career, which pretty much we all are. Thank you very much. Just one second. Don Placido is very much involved in choosing of the, the people who will come to the, uh, the competition. And one of the great things that he does is encourage. Uh, of course, that's what this is all about anyway, is encouraging young artists of, of great talent. <laughs> Talent recognizes talent. So Placido recognizes talent when it comes to, when even the beginning. Even the, the first uh, s sound of talent, he grabs it, he says, but this is interesting. Of the 40 original contestants, 14 have been chosen by Domingo and his fellow judges to appear at the grand final. But while the jury selects the three main prize winners, Domingo adds a popular touch by inviting the audience to vote for their own choice as well. Put all things together, the first audition, the second audition and the finals, but to remember that unfortunately, the finals of course is in front of the public, and uh, somebody that has been really phenomenal in the two auditions, it might go down. If we are here to qualify people that need to be ready to make a career, so all those considerations we have to take, besides the voice, of course, the personality. finals of the eighth edition of Operalia competition. You have indications in the program of how many great singers they have been coming out of this competition and this year you are going to judge and you are going to realize that we have had such an extraordinary high level is going to be the most difficult task for the judges to decide who the winners will be. You will see for yourself.
I was never in a competition, and uh, I really have a great admiration for all the people that comes to competitions because it must be so frightening. But on the other hand, it's, it's kind of a sport uh, uh, feeling. It's, it's like, a, like the Olympics of the singing. The finalists now have to wait an anxious 30 minutes while Domingo and the jury deliberate and the audience votes are counted. Placido is signing checks. I become kind of a father and uh, to them and uh, more or less in a little time and maybe grandfather because the, the, sing the singers are going younger and younger. Ladies and gentlemen, first of all, the third place, the third prize, it has been a tie between a tenor and a bass. And it is Mr. Konstantin Andreev and Mr. Robert Pomakov. Okay. We have one of the winners this year, of course, uh, was kind of a unusual thing. It was a bass and was 19 years old. The second prize also has been a tide. And it has been shared by a Russian tenor, Mr. Daniel Stoda. The Chinese soprano, Miss He Hui. And the first prize it goes for Miss Isabel Bayragdarian. vote and you have decided that the prize of the public go to Miss Virginia Tola. <laughs> we 
you go to any competition, people win the prize, and then that's it. Here I am in contact with the singers. I can use them. We make the, the winners' concerts, you know, which I participate with them, I sing with them. You realize that it is a fantastic uh, atmosphere. Rehearsal of Parsifal, and, and sometimes when I when I go from one place to another, I I look a couple of words because the Parsifal is one of those uh, uh, operas. Then even if you have done it uh, several times, uh, you find something else. You know, you find an intonation. All the chromatics is so is so difficult. You you, you find something that per perhaps is. A, a little bit. So yesterday night we had the other orchestra uh, rehearsal, and I used uh, a couple of spots that I that I see that I can improve for today, and then by the time of the premiere we'll be ready. <laughs> so I always like to. I mean, this is the this is the right uh, the nice feeling, you know, so that when you are close to 60, you are still a, a student. What is true about Placido and is. <laughs> an amazing thing is that uh, I mean I don't know where is the formula but uh, he he sounds fresher and fresher every day he sounds amazingly in form so I mean the man is is a surprise each voice has a different aging and uh, of course uh, you know when you are older you know mm, let's say uh, trick but are not really trick you know, experience than you did know before, and when you are young, you are you have the freshness of the of the innocent, who is typical of of a, of a young singer. It's very difficult to say which one is better. I think it's better when you are young, of course. <laughs> The works of Wagner are amongst the most demanding in opera, and at nearly five hours in length, Parsifal is the tenor's greatest challenge. For singers of Domingo's age, and raised in the tradition of Italian opera, Wagner can prove particularly tough. At the beginning I thought that perhaps I, my voice was not for Wagner, but very early in my life though I sang Lohengrin. It was a great success, but however, I feel that it has harmed a little bit my voice. And I realized later on that it was not Wagner that has harmed my voice, but it was the preparation. I have gone to a pianist, uh, to a co-repetitor, 
just to to do it because of course the the, the for the German language I have to go to somebody and I was working hours and hours and hours and hours every day and in fact I have that year I have perhaps the only vocal crisis that it was kind of important in my whole career <laughs> It was some years before he came back to Wagner. It was difficult for him. The language was difficult. The tessitura of Wagner, it doesn't lie naturally for his voice. In a Verdi or a Puccini aria, it's a very clear where the aria is and the high notes tend to come at the end of it and most of it lies well within the voice with perhaps a great big kapow towards the end somewhere. Wagner doesn't write like that. Wagner is more continuous with occasional big powerful high notes. Those who say that the German isn't perfect, or that perhaps he works too hard at the German in order to get it right. Very difficult for a Spaniard who sings a lot of Italian works. Sometimes it's for vocal. Yeah, yeah. Comes to than one but it's perfect. One can say, yeah. Nobody is more interesting in my voice than myself, you know. So I have always been careful, and I have always been really very conscious of what I have been doing. But if I will follow the idea of the critics, probably my repertoire, it will be, uh, rather than 117 operas, it will be maybe 25 or 30, you know? That's for sure. Know? But the big moments, they are there. The moment oh. now on the... It's better when I... Yes. Tell us yes. yes. And you know something? Ede Cuberto. As a musician, I was immediately fascinated by this work, which is monumental. The way you hear Parsifal, it is a, it is a way that you, that you hear a work uh, not only uh, because of the musical uh, greatness of the work, but almost in a religious way. He's now regarded as one of the great um, Wagnerian tenors of modern times. 
certainly the most lyrical, the most beautiful, in some ways the most insightful. There are those who will carp about the language, or they'll say it's almost too beautiful and too lyrical, and it lacks something of the edge of the Wagnerian characterization. But uh, compared with most of the other Wagnerian tenors of the last 30, 30 years or more, I know whom I'd prefer to hear. I think Domingo is, is coming slowly and reluctantly to the end of his career as a singer. He's been in the business for something like 43 years, uh, and, um, and it, it just has to be. At some point, he's just going to have to call it a day. That would be a very sad time for opera goers. Um, however, it's probably better than sticking around until no one really wants to hear you anymore, which has happened with a few people I won't mention. The next three, four years are the tough ones, and there are the ones to make decisions about what exactly I will be doing once I stop singing. I suspect he'll probably end up running one of the very, very big world opera companies. I see Washington, and probably L.A. too, as stepping stones. Yeah, if one day uh, I'm prepared and they want me in one of those houses, of course, will be a great, uh, great, great pleasure, you know. But at the moment, uh, I think it's still, still few or several years <laughs> far from that.